I want to ask you both again, just to you know, take a step back, breath down at the moment, just about the politics of how things are starting to play out, about net zero, about the rollout, about the blow-ups, about the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the magic source and maybe the big mistakes here, right? So the Prime Minister thinks that this is the middle road, which is essentially, in practical terms, no change to 2030, and yes, aspirational between 30 and 50, but not to lock it in like Labor would plan to do, right? For Labor, of course, they go, ha-ha, we were right all the way along. The only problem is everything they say about not being costed and all the... That's their own policy that they're whacking away at, um, and they don't have a set uh, target for 2030. But, of course, it's not enough for those who think we should be doing even more, including Sir David Attenborough. I think it would be really catastrophic if the, the developed nations of the world, the more powerful nations of the world, simply ignored these these problems. Do we say, oh, it's nothing to do with us and cross our, cross our arms? We caused it. Our, our kind of industrialization is one of the major factors in producing this change in climate. So we have a moral responsibility, even if we didn't cause it. We would have a moral responsibility. Now, of course, no one's going to bash up on Sir David Attenborough. My issue, of course, is that um, it's not like we're doing nothing. We're doing the something. Are we doing the everything? Well, even if you do the everything, of course, China can replace us in 16 days with what they're doing. Hence the Balancing Act. That's where the PM's playing his line and the politics. I'm not embarrassed at, one, at all when it comes to doing what's right by Australia. Everyone else who doesn't understand Australia, our economy and the challenges that we have here, they're entitled to their opinions. But I'm going to do what's right for Australia. And Australia's getting results. As I said, our emissions reduction, better than New Zealand, better than the United States, better than Canada, better uh, than Japan. We're getting it done. Our emissions are down. Our economy is up. We're actually showing them the way. Lisa, being the Queenslander, you get to go first here. Let's talk about it. You understand uh, messaging, all the rest of it. What do you think about what he's trying to achieve and whether it connects or not? Well, I think the Prime Minister Scott Morrison has to walk a very fine line on this. He has to... He's got people saying, um, look, the net zero is out there. There's a huge call for everybody to make a commitment to it. Look, nobody wants to see uh, emissions continue to increase. We're, we're all on the same field when it comes to that. But we also don't want to see our economy completely collapse or completely have a transition across into this, this new wealth that's just going to create whole new industries of people that are cashing in on this race to net zero while we see our resource sector and our agriculture sector you know, cop it in the neck. So in Queensland, you're talking about the response here today. Well, the CFMEU have said across regional Queensland, both Labor and the Coalition are going to cop it as a, a revolt against this decision that's been made because... You know, we are all seeing people within the Liberal Party angry at what's happened, but I just don't think Scott Morrison had a choice. He had to take something to Glasgow, unfortunately. He has to be there for the photo op at the end of it. And he comes back and, look, hopefully the, we can transition through without destroying our economy completely, but mm. it is a long game. And I think Angus Taylor nailed it today when he said it's about respecting people's choices. It's not about not eating beef tomorrow. It's not about Correct. insisting that we all drive electric cars tomorrow. You know, it has to be managed and it has to be done in a way that it is a transition. It is not an extinction of our resource sector. Absolutely. I think that's going to be the best place for them to sit. To be honest, I think that, you know, technology versus taxes is a good thing until you start going, well, hang on, which mm. technologies? Um, but then I think that whole right to choose thing. Again, Darren, you're more sort of on the labour side of things here. Um, you know, you've seen it fought uphill, down dale and all the rest. But, you know, I put it this way again, and the flaming you cop for saying this, but it's just the truth, right? And I, my job is to tell people the truth, which is the global standard now is you must be this high to ride the roller coaster. And this never, never target of 2050 is that this high to ride the roller coaster. Yeah, that's true, Paul. That, but, uh, you yeah, know, what others have said that, uh, Prime Minister Morrison has to go to Glasgow and have something to say and has to be able to return to Australia having achieved something. And that partly because it's been such a festering issue for really since before the 2007 federal election. And also he's got a bunch of moderate Liberal seats that he needs to win uh, and he needs to balance that with... The, you know, the seats in Queensland, the seats in regional New South Wales, the seats in, you know, the Latrobe Valley. There's a whole... Australia's a difficult country to run and 
when he says that he's you know, trying to act in Australia's best interest, that means different things to different people. But as a bare minimum, going to Glasgow with something to say and something to sell is the minimum, you know, as you say, the, the ticket to ride. And I think he achieves that. But And I don't think Labor has a lot of room to move. I think the risk for the Prime Minister is more towards those climate independence in moderate Liberal seats. Mm. That's a bigger issue for the PM and we'll have to wait and see what happens between now and Election Day on that front. Well, also, you know, I, I, think that, I think that, again, the planning around all of this, Lisa, is the assumption that the election is not about this in March or April or May. By March, April or May, all by Western Australia, um, is reunited, free travel, the economy returns to uh, more people employed than pre-pandemic, uh, the standing and the contrasts about issues like China, national security. These are the things that, that they're going to want to talk about. And again, I just talk about the political record here, right? The capacity of Scott Morrison to change the subject for the five weeks of the 2019 election can't be underscored about his capacity to focus the mind about the 29, about 2022. Now, I don't know what the attack ads are. There's plenty of attack that you can run on any prime minister that's been around for a while, so you can't anticipate all incoming. But I think that's part of the bet. Knowing that Glasgow is this week means you can you can frankly turn the noise down on that. And the people who love it or hate it can sort of be out on the side and then the focus is about COVID recovery. That's what I think the, the, the play is. Yeah, and Paul, I think you're right. And, and the way I look at this is what he's effectively done, and excuse me for the pun, but he's tried to take the heat out of it. So he knows he has to go to Glasgow, that the pressure is on him. However, you know, just, just Jacinda Ardern isn't, isn't going to Glasgow. Yeah. Could you imagine if she was going and, and Prime Minister Scott Morrison wasn't? Oh, my gosh, the, the left media here would be having an absolute field day. But Correct. put that aside for one minute. You've got Ru Russia and China aren't going. Scott Morrison has pretty much been wedged into a position where he needs to make a, a some sort of a ambition or commitment or target or whatever, whatever plan, whatever you want to call it. And hopefully he can then say it's on the table... Make the point of difference between Labor will legislate it, we've got it as an ambition, try and placate the electorate that way, and then, like you say, move the conversation on. Because once we get past Glasgow, then hopefully we will then just be focused on the federal election and it will go back to the economy because we do have to focus on rebuilding this country. Yeah. You know, it's ridiculous. We're sending all this iron ore, uh, all of our coal over to, over to China. They'll keep continuing to build their, their coal-fired power stations. And I heard the the very fiery argument between Joe and um, Roman Bishop earlier tonight. And look, you know, it's exactly the argument that's being held around dinner tables around this country at the moment. It's, it's just crazy. We're seeing our resources going offshore, and yet here we're having to have resource companies spend all of this money to put in decarbonisation plans, to um, meet the requirements of the banks or the superannuation funds that won't fund... Uh, any projects they want to put forward if they don't have all of these commitments in place. So, like I said, there's a whole new economy coming out of this, and it's not just our solar farms and our, you know, the windmills that you can float off the ocean somewhere. It's all the people who are cashing in along the way and, and clipping mm. the ticket. Well, and, and, and this has been my issue too about all of this, is when I see things in the paper, uh, you know, uh, uh, business demands this, demands... No, no, we've been told yep. you can't build a coal fire power station because nobody will lend you the money. Well, guess what they lend the money to? All the projects that these people are demanding the government should help them out with or give them more money for, right? Um, every local council will back it in. So at some point in time, you know, I, I certainly think that's now, which is, OK, we'll give you the headline, the detail, it's up to you. Do what every business has had to do, which is apply for a loan, find a plot of land, and if you want to build it, good luck to you then, uh, and we'll see what happens.